Hey, Cypher here. There's an open question in the history profession that if sufficiently answered, could not only change the way that we conceive the world as a whole, but give a pretty definitive way for world politics to advance in the future. It's kind of what you could call a holy grail in the history profession. And that question can be phrased a number of ways, but I guess a good way of phrasing it is, why did the Western world become the overall hegemonic power of the globe? Put simply, is what makes the West strong? Like why was Europe able to conquer pretty much the entirety of Africa by the end of the 19th century? What made them such an unstoppable force? If we can answer that question, we can say what's the best course of action for developing nations around the world. That's kind of the whole idea behind modernization theory. But you can probably also tell that this has never been satisfactorily answered. It's still a holy grail, and it probably just can't be answered, to be honest. And while there are many, many answers to that question, the most popular is Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel. And you'll see Diamond's answer all over the place. In fact, he made a documentary for Nat Geo specifically around this answer. But of course, Guns, Germs, and Steel has its detractors. In fact, some historians go so far as to call it pseudo-history. Now, I wouldn't go that far by any stretch, but there are enough problems with his hypothesis that we can't take it as a particularly good answer either. So let's talk about that, and specifically how the continent of Africa and its history kind of contradict the entirety of Guns, Germs, and Steel. But before we get to that, this is actually part of a massive collaboration. We're all talking about African history. Before me was Mr. Beat, doing one of his compared videos between Rwanda and Burundi. And since this video is actually the end of the playlist, the beginning of the playlist is Kagido, who's talking about the San people, or the San people, I don't know how to pronounce that. So if you're not on the playlist already, it's time to fix that. But if you're already on it, let's talk about how the continent of Africa and its history makes a bit of a mockery of guns, germs, and steel. Jared Diamond's book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, attempts to answer how the West diverged to become the hegemonic power of the world. Or as one of his New Guinean friends put it, why is it that you white people developed so much cargo and brought it to New Guinea, but we black people had little cargo of our own? Diamond's answer is essentially crop and animal domestication. Up to what he calls the starting line, humanity was fairly uniformly advanced. But then, an unfortunately named Great Leap Forward happened with the agricultural revolution. Those who could domesticate crops and animals did, leading to a disproportionate amount of domestication happening in Eurasia, who ultimately gained things like farm animals and a whole variety of staple crops, which meant an abundance of food, bringing the eventual decline of hunting and gathering as a chief source of caloric intake in much of Eurasia. Due to living in close proximity to domesticated animals, people came into contact with more disease, but also became immune to much of these germs in the process. Many were freed from the regular chores of producing food by the Great Leap Forward. So they began to group together in cities. The urbanization that these domestications allowed meant people could focus on more abstract pursuits, such as metallurgy and mining eventually leading to steel, which in turn allowed for further inventiveness. The Eurasian continent outstripped the development of other continents until guns were invented, leaving us with the final piece of the puzzle. Sounds pretty good, right? But the devil is in the details. To explain why Africa couldn't develop alongside Eurasia, he relies on a theory of continental axes. As you can see here, the Americas and Africa have a north-south axis, whereas Eurasia has an east-west one. 
This supposedly allowed crops to be more easily transposed throughout Eurasia, since they didn't have to adapt to more northerly or southerly climates. The problem is that Diamond appears to not understand domestication nor the inherent problems of that map. Considering Diamond is a professor of geography, he should have noted that the Mercator projection does a giant disservice to Africa, which his second to last chapter is completely devoted to. The standard map that we all see wasn't designed to make the continents comparable sizes. It was meant to keep latitudinal lines straight for easier navigation. This has had an adverse effect of making areas closer to the equator appear immensely smaller than they really are. Africa is the worst affected by this. It is the second biggest continent after Asia, yet Europe somehow looks similarly sized. The projection is not some artifact of imperialism, as some people like to claim, but the downsizing of Africa in much of the world's minds is nonetheless the result of this nautically oriented map, and it appears to have affected Diamond as well. This axis theory is fundamental to his analysis of Africa, despite Eurasia having the same north-south axis as Africa. The difference from Africa's north-south distance and its east-west distance is only 8%. Seriously, 5,000 miles one way, 4,600 the other. You can't get more arbitrary than these lines on a map. Sub-Saharan Africa is not some wasteland that couldn't support these animals and crops. In fact, much of the domesticated products that supposedly helped Europe become dominant were to be found in Africa centuries prior to European invasions, along with plenty of their own. Europeans were able to bring their crops to Africa without much need for extra domestication. Colonial holdings in Africa often produced a good chunk of the grain for their empires as a whole. Africa is geographically diverse enough to support everything Europe had. It is incorrect to claim that Africa couldn't domesticate enough species to compete. Not only could they, but they did. Diamond seems to acknowledge this by saying, Africa's diverse peoples resulted from its diverse geography and its long prehistory. But he spends the rest of that chapter saying, the difference was due to accidents of geography and biogeography, in particular to Africa's different areas, axes, and suites of wild plant and animal species. By reverting to that axis theory, he speaks of Africa as though it was some isolated entity prior to European conquest, which is definitely false. As James Blount, himself a geographer like Diamond, said of this axis theory, geography is important, but not that important. While the Sahara acts as a massive barrier even today, it was not something that couldn't be overcome. Romans explored into Sub-Saharan Africa in the first century BC. Turks and Arabs were trading in African slaves as early as the 7th century AD. The Indian Ocean was interconnected by trade dating back to at least the Bronze Age. And trade caravans across the Sahara were recorded in ancient Egyptian records. In short, Sub-Saharan Africa was connected by trade. In East Africa's case, far more so than Europe. So, isolation is not a sufficient answer. So it doesn't make sense when Diamond says, Europeans entering Africa enjoyed the triple advantage of guns and other technology, widespread literacy, and the political organization necessary to sustain expensive programs of exploration and conquest. Clearly there was an advantage, but Africa had all of those things in certain places, and were often comparable to Europe. As far afield as the Mali and Songhai empires in West Africa, a grand civilization developed as part of the Trans-Saharan trade. As one historian says, From the north, West Africa received brass and copper, cloth and spices, manufactured goods and horses, and Saharan salt, and in return, it exported gold, slaves, skins and leather, and ivory. Timbuktu became legendary for literally paying gold weight for weight with salt shipments. Further south was the Kingdom of Benin, which at the time had one of the largest planned cities in history, laid out in a fractal design with wide thoroughfares, underground drainage, and street lighting in the 15th century. As one visitor described it, 
Great Benin, where the king resides, is larger than Lisbon. All the streets run straight and as far as the eye can see. The houses are large and especially that of the king, which is richly decorated and has fine columns. The city is wealthy and industrious. It is so well governed that theft is unknown and the people live in such security that they have no doors to their houses. So Blout's explanation of continental axes falls flat when such wealth existed and was transmitted throughout Africa. This speaks to a couple key problems with guns, germs, and steel. Specifically, his neglect of contingency and his tendency to view societies as holistic entities. Honestly, it's pretty weird to try answering why the West is strong by analyzing continents as a whole. Africa, let alone any other continent, is a huge and diverse place. There is more genetic diversity in the human population of Africa than all other continents combined. When people say, I'm traveling to Africa, that would be the same as saying, I'm traveling to Asia. Like, what does that even mean? But for some reason, we all treat Africa as a singular country when it's an entire continent. Like, here's a tool called the true size of, which is linked in the description. It shows you how badly our sense of size has been warped by the Mercator projection. That type of map was never meant to give us a sense of size, and yet we use it like that. It's a navigational map. Guns, Germs, and Steel is an important work, but we cannot take it seriously when it speaks of Africa. Personally, I like his explanation for the new world, but not the old. He gets especially bad with his epilogue, where he basically says China was too tyrannical to become a world power. That's called Oriental Despotism, which is the racist idea Asians and Northern Africans needed to control water in their countries, called hydraulic societies, so they naturally resort to tyrannical rule. Suffice it to say, Diamond has been nailed pretty badly for that idea. This whole thing made Blout say, His argument is scientific because he claims to produce reliable, scientific answers to these problems when in fact, he does not have such answers, and because he discards wholesale the findings of social science while inserting old and discredited theories of environmental determinism, that is bad science. I mean, one, History isn't a science, so Blout is also working off of some rather obsolete ideas. But look, we shouldn't treat guns, germs, and steel as pseudo-history, because Diamond is not arguing in bad faith. He has a point with the New World, but Africa disproves his overall theory, making way for a truly terrible end to the book. Whatever made the West strong, it wasn't the continental axis of Africa. The question of Western hegemony is still open to debate. Is there a fin race going out there? God damn it. And here comes a helicopter. Doopy doop doop doo. By the Great Leap Forward. It's a navigational map. It's a navigational map. Ah, come on. It's a navigational map. <laughs>